The Guest House by Rumi. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some commentary, uh, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. It's been a while, this trusty bench. I think I still trust it. Oh, okay. Good to see you all, some young people. We got some purple dots on the ground. They look like little grapes that have been squished. If you wanna come forward or young people, John Fisher, anyone who wants to come forward can totally, Cynthia, if you wanna come sit. I have some things to talk to you about. Last week I came back and I saw some of your faces and I, I'm seeing some new faces and I'm seeing some faces out there I didn't see last week. And um, it's so good to be back with you all. And one of the things I'm gonna be doing these next two weeks and I bet for, for months to come is sharing stories from my sabbatical journey and hearing about all of your stories because have you grown in the last four months, anyone, an inch, or maybe you've learned something new in school or in your family? So we've all grown a lot. And so I want to hear about how you've grown and changed. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit, one part of something I did when I was on my journey. So one of the things that my sabbatical was about, sabbatical just means like kind of a break, a little bit of some space. And so I went on this break the space from being here and I went on a lot of journeys and one of them was to go and look for my ancestors Does anyone know what the word ancestors means you know what the word ancestors mean anyone out there it means someone who is from your family but likely from long ago and most likely they're not living anymore that's kind of part of the graduation into ancestors and so and so uh no matter how old we feel this morning we are no we're not ancestors yet so um i am glad that we are here together and i wanted to talk a little bit about some ancestors i went to go look for because i don't have any ancestors in indiana because hattie and i moved here before when we were adults and um, so I had to go back in time and to other places in the world of, of the United States to um, look for some of those ancestors. And do you know where a lot of people find their ancestors? In cemeteries. Thank you. And so one of the places I went to was to some cemeteries. So here's a picture in Milwaukee, and this is with my mom and some little kid in there. I don't know. That must be... Holly and we were walking and we were going to look for my mom's parents and so we went and we looked and we finally found it we found this this thing and my mom being a teacher as she is of course invited Holly to do what a rubbing and so she gave her a piece of paper and then she could use a pencil or a crayon to write over the name and this is Gronemeyer Gronemeyer some of my jokes are like groan, a Meyer. No, okay, thank you. And uh, so we, 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 uh, thank you. Um, so we went and we did that. And that was my mom's parents who died in the late 90s. So it's been a few, been quite a few years for us, but it was really great to have Holly and me and my mom. We also went to all these other funerals around Wisconsin, um, Milwaukee area. So all of my mom's 16 great grandparents. So each of you have 16 great grandparents. That's right. All 16 of them came from Germany to like a 10 mile, 20 mile radius in Wisconsin. So we were all kind of close um, after a few generations. And so we went out looking for different uh, places. And this was one church that was so important because it was the place that um, many of them came. It was a German speaking church, uh, Frieden's uh, church in Jackson, Wisconsin. And just a quarter mile down the road is where the family farm was. And that was a different part 
that was my mom's mom's side. And so, but many, many generations uh, were buried in the cemetery near it. Um, and so we'll, so here's a kind of a view. It's not easy to see the, the, the gravestones on the top, but a lot of family members. So I was walking around looking for names that I've heard about, but maybe never met, but I was trying to find them. And later then my dad and I, my dad and I went on a different trip. We were looking uh, for his side of the family and the cables were only in Wisconsin for, my dad wasn't even born in Wisconsin. So we're relatively new on that side. And so we had to go to Ohio and we had to go to Massachusetts and Connecticut. And that's way far away. And my dad was uh, willing to stay in the car with me for those 3000 miles that we were in the car driving. Um, so Pierce, that's my dad's uh, mom's maiden name. And then Kennedy, that's another one. I love this picture. It's kind of like farm fields and just really beautiful horizon and sky. And there, here's another one, Cable, we know that name. And Lawrence, that's my middle name. That's my dad's uncle. Uh, that's where we found that one. And that was the first time you've seen that grave, right? You hadn't seen it prior. I don't think so. Well, then we went into this big place. This is a really interesting place if you haven't been to a mausoleum. It's where there's like an inside place where people don't want to get stay in the rain so they come inside and they get these nice indoor suites um it's very nice and so we got to walk up and down my dad and i looked through this place that they said had five thousand residents which is an interesting term residents five thousand residents we were lost for a long time but eventually my dad found his uh grandparents uh up there cable grace and earl cable and actually my dad just brought down this weekend earl cable's porch swing that we hung up um at, over at our house so that's a nice continuation of that so we found them then we went over to this small little uh uh place in manoa ohio this is outside of cleveland um and we we found bina and emily bina is my dad's great-grandfather um and it, Grace's dad, Bina, and this was really cool because Bina left this um, amount of money to the city to keep the, the grounds looking really nice, which is a nice thing to remember when we talk to you about endowments. Uh, that's really important, um, but it's really nice to keep it looking beautiful so people can come and visit. This was probably my favorite. Look at this. I love this, um, and it's hard to see on the top left there. There's this, um, what are they called, uh, a dry laid uh, wall. Uh, rocks, you know, so there's no mortar or anything. It's just rocks that create this little dividing barrier. Um, and it's so, and it's very prominent throughout New England. And then this very beautifully right into the, the um, right against the side of the hill um, in Griswold, Connecticut. Uh, and that was, that was probably the highlight, um, that place. We found a holly plant. That's good. That was in one of the places, um, or tree, holly tree. And so that was worth catching. Here's another cable. We found a lot. This is a good one. We had one falling over. So my dad tried to pick it up to pay his respects. We tried to push it up, but that was one of the cables. And then, oh my gosh, and we'll talk more, more about this over time, but my, my mom and I went to Europe to look for our German ancestors, Weckmeller. That's my mom's grandma's, uh, my mom's mom's side of the family. And we found this place uh, out in the, middle of a small town that I knew was where all the Weckmillers came from. There's only 200 people there, 200 people in this whole town. And so pretty much everyone was a Weckmiller or three or four other families. And I, and I, and I'll tell this story in a longer way in a different time, but then we found someone who was named Weckmiller. And this is this guy who's like probably a 10th cousin. So clearly spit an image of each other. Um, um i uh and we had a great time he invited me over to his house and we he actually owns the cemetery this plot of land where the cemetery is and we got to look through history and family stuff and uh between his english and my uh um you know charisma we were able to hit hit it off and uh make a good a good a good little connection there so that's jorg jorg weckmiller anyway so what i wanted to say was that sometimes when we talk about cemeteries 
um, or death. It can be kind of scary for kids and for adults. I never wanted to go near a cemetery when I was a little kid, but going on this trip made me have such a new appreciation for these places that we drive by all the time, these cemeteries, because there's people's stories there, there's people's loved ones that give us a, an opportunity to reflect about all the love and life that those people once lived. And so, um, you know, when we think, when we drive by a cemetery next time, I really encourage you to kind of just be like curious, huh, I wonder, I wonder whose ancestors were buried there. We have two readings today. The first is titled Missing Key by Heather Newman. The doors are locked and I'm searching for a way in. I circle my house intent on finding a crack in the system I painstakingly created, a loose bolt, a faulty window. It's still light in Vermont, but in one hour, the sun will dip behind the mountain, temperatures will fall, and I may still be outside, stuck, cursing. There are friends, there are neighbors, or I could resolve nothing, sit on the cool grass and wait. On my iPhone, I view my furious attempts to break in, recorded on the outdoor cameras. There are family members who hold a key, but resources have never worked for me, uh, but rescues have never worked for me in the past. I consider places for lost or hidden keys. They say gratitude is a key. Solitude is a mountain. There are pines, cedars, and hemlocks, a range against the mango magenta horizon, a red-tailed hawk circling its prey. The Once Invisible Garden by Lauren Laura Foley. How did I come to be this particular version of me, and not some other this morning, of purple delphiniums blooming like royalty, destined to meet these three dogs asleep at my feet and not others? This soft summer morning, sitting on her screened porch, become ours, our wind chime, singing of wind and time, yellow-white digitalis, feeding bees and filling me. And more abundance to come, basil, tomatoes, zucchini, what luck or fate, instinct or grace brought me here in shade, beneath hidden stars, a soft summer morning, seeing with my whole being, love made visible. Contemplating my mountains. For 15 years, I lived in one of the California gold country slash mother load towns high in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Commuting to and from Air National Guard drill weekends in Reno during that time made me well acquainted with Highway 88 Carson Pass, elevation 8,574 feet. The well-paved road has steep climbs, rapid descents, constant curves, and road shoulders hugging rock walls on one lane and ravines on the other. The rugged scenery of huge boulders, tough old windswept bristlecone pines, groves of slender aspens, small alpine lakes, and the intensely blue skies inspire awe at every turn. I never tired of my three hour solitary drive over these mountains. And just as in life, those mountains sometimes presented challenges and fears. Driving in a blizzard whiteout behind a California snowplow at 15 miles an hour, for example, felt like being in a bright, unending tunnel with no sense of hills or curves. 
Two of my three marriages had periods like that when I had to navigate slowly, carefully, and just trust things would be okay eventually. Feelings like claustrophobia, insecurity, or a sense of futility have something in common with all other feelings, even the good ones. They are momentary. If I knew or remembered in the past that some feelings or emotions are temporary, I might have made better life choices. With hindsight, I know that at least twice in my life, many decades ago, mountains of grief or fear made me vulnerable to accepting so-called helpful suggestions too quickly. The word vulnerable in those situations meant weakness and fragility. But the word vulnerable can have other meanings depending on context. Members of this congregation have commented on my openness and willingness to share personal aspects of my history and how they have shaped who I am today. I guess for some, that seems like a brave thing to do. Recalling the past, including mistakes, can invite negative judgment. But here's the thing. I do not feel vulnerable when talking about my past. I have finally come to an age and place in my life where I can feel at home, at home with myself as well as others. Mountain roads always took me home. My commutes through Carson Pass provide solitude, a quiet place to reflect. The long drive to Reno allowed time to transition from domestic concerns to the mindset required for air guard duties. A large part of my identity, my self-confidence, and a sense of belonging came from my guard family. Driving that road in either direction took me home. Now my home is here in Columbus. I am full of gratitude for the kindness and caring given to me and my husband over the past 16 years by UUCCI. Remembering that love is reflected in love, I can say that gratitude is truly a key that opens doors of compassion and belonging, welcoming a person home. Again and again, we come back to these questions, not questions bound by time, but eternal, flowing, evolving questions of the human experience of our shared journey, questions that vibrate through the universe all the way back to the beginning. One might consider the questions we grappled with during our sabbatical, such as, where do I come from? What am I? Where am I going? Are questions that are relevant only in extraordinary circumstances, of which sabbatical surely is one. But I have come to believe that the questions of our lives, the mysteries of the universe are present, persistent, and they won't let us go. The questions do not change. The only difference, and it is a big difference between ordinary and extraordinary time, is that during a sabbatical, for example, we are gifted with the blessing of spaciousness. Sabbatical is a gift of space, a time during which we can find our bearings, reconnect with our loved ones, remember who we are at our most essential level, and find breath and quiet and energy for whatever is to come. I am so grateful for the gift you all offered me to take a sabbatical these past four months. I cannot express or begin to articulate the impact it has had on my heart, my soul, on my ministry and family, and on my sense of rootedness here in Columbus, Indiana. I learned a lot about myself as a partner and as a father. I learned about my values and my responsibilities, or said differently, I, remember, I remembered what values I claim and by what and whom I am claimed in return. 
I remembered what values I claim and by what and whom I am claimed in return. Over the months ahead, we will have many opportunities to talk about our individual experiences during this extraordinary gift of space. And from the little I have heard in the time I have been back, you all had quite a lot of experiences that brought up clarity and new questions about who we are as individuals and who we are together in this shared journey through life. Originally, I thought that a two-part series upon my return would be an easy enough task to help share, uh, share and process my sabbatical. I have come to learn it is an impossible task. So instead, I hope to share just a few snapshots of my journey, of my learning, of my time away to help illustrate a few transformations I noticed within me as both a human and your minister. In our first reading today, we received the striking imagery of a locked house to set the scene. Heather Newman writes, the doors are locked and I'm searching for a way in. I circle my house intent on finding a crack in the system I painstakingly created, a loose bolt, a faulty window. When I read this poem for the first time, those words hit me as such a personal and common experience for humans. The thought of being locked out of one's own home, a place of comfort and warmth, creates a sense of anxiety and helplessness. The only thing worse, perhaps, is the thought of being locked out of one's own heart, one's own soul, and one's own true self. One paradox of being a minister is that I am, on the one hand, quite visible. I'm seen. I am present and connected with you, and together we offer care and support to one another and our congregation and the world. All the while, a truer sense of myself, of my essence, can get lost at times in the process. Sometimes who I truly am or we truly are can become obscured and inaccessible because of the work, the life, the journey. Or you could think of it this way, as you or I, or as we blend into a community such as this congregation or into a family or a society or a job or into the role and responsibilities we play within any of those communities, such as me being the minister of this community, it can be easy to lose one's individual sense of identity. Yet our dual identities as both individuals and a community is the dynamic that unlocks the true power of our human experience, a related paradox. We are both one and together we are one. We are both one and together we are one. As such, becoming locked out of one's home or heart or congregation for that matter, you didn't change the keys, uh, the locks, which I really appreciate while I was gone, need not, in my opinion, be seen as the worst thing in the world. A time of sabbatical, for example, can liberate us, not just me as your minister, but for you too as the congregation. It can uh, liberate us from our constant status quo of rootedness, of familiarity, of routine, in order to understand more deeply who we are and where we are as both individuals and as a community, and in turn find new ways of being and being together in this life. Going on sabbatical for me was an opportunity to be locked out of the familiar the familiar routines of life and ministry, the familiar roles and responsibilities and connections that have come to orient and define my purpose, my happiness, and my very existence. The question I faced early on this January was, can I really put down the work, the ministry? Can I really take off the robe, the soul, and just be, just be? In letting go of that magnitude of such an essential part of my identity, the chaos and disorientation that could follow could have easily forced me to rush for help, to call for help, to break in through the nearest window to ensure that I would only stay out in the cold and in the discomfort for the shortest time possible. Heather Newman explains this, reflecting on my options. She writes, there are friends, 
they're our neighbors, or I could resolve nothing and just sit on the cool grass and wait. This is a very compelling third option, quite countercultural idea and often not my go-to modus operandi in times of change and stress, to do nothing, to sit, to wait, but to wait for what? She goes on to remind us of the familiar, of the familial. She says, there are family members who hold a key, but rescues have never worked for me in the past. Boy, that's interesting. She goes on to remind us, there are family members who hold a key, but rescues have never worked for me in the past. In extraordinary times, such as a sabbatical, there is almost always some type of letting go that is necessary, a letting go of the familiar, of the comfortable, of control, in order to experience something new. Something new. For me, I did gather around ministerial colleagues the first week of my sabbatical, but not because they would bring me the misplaced key to my own heart home. I gather not because they would solve my questions or my problems. No, I invited the three trusted UU ministers over to my home in the cold of early January to hold space for me. Hold space for me so that I could explore in relative safety the contours and cracks, the texture and the temperature of the home I have long nurtured throughout my life and the heart that has nurtured and held me in return. We gathered to do nothing, to sit, to wait. And in our gathering, our sitting and our waiting, nothing came from beyond me. No answer, no path, nothing. No clarity came from beyond me, rather something emerged from within me. A recognition, a gift of awareness, the strength only found and nurtured in my solitude and sojourn that was to follow. I have to say, I listened to this, I looked at this bench during the time for all, or the, the um, moment of silence. It says, what lies beyond us and what lies before us are tiny matters to co compared to what lies within us. I remember in that moment sitting with colleagues and the strength I felt in knowing that my way forward through the questions I carried with me in sabbatical would be discovered through the solitude I would experience in the coming months, alone. During this time, I was often surrounded by others, my parents or family, friends, but it was in those moments of quiet contemplation and personal introspection that I found the beauty within me, the strength to move forward. Heather Newman says, solitude is a mountain. And I navigated those, uh, that mountainous terrain through an exploration of my ancestry in part. It is easy to feel a sense of solitude when considering one's ancestry, right? Because for, uh, but for a relative few people still living, our ancestors are no longer with us. They have come and gone, traversed this precious life this mountain, they have experienced the joys and sorrows and considered the questions and mysteries of the universe. Our ancestors are no longer beyond me, but rather within me, animating a desire to explore the paths, encouraging me to explore the paths they once took as I continue to explore my own. The first month of my sabbatical was a time of solemn pilgrim, pilgrimage excuse me, and solitude. I spent it with both my mom and dad separately on journeys through Wisconsin, the Midwest, and New England, over 3,000 miles, looking for that sign of connection of my root kin to find a key, something to aid me in my return home to the heart of my soul. As I mentioned earlier, much comfort and strength was found wandering through cemeteries in the United States and in Europe, each different, yet all connected by a common thread. They were the sacred grounds in which the end of countless people's journeys in this life were marked in ritual and release. They created plots and paths. They dotted a holy landscape now for those who continue along the journey. It is so quiet, 
in a cemetery in the residence of memory and stillness. A quiet solitude in the cold of winter, no less, which gave me a sense of calm and connection I didn't know I could find nor that I needed. Yet gifts to this day I cherish and feel deep in my bones. Solitude is a mountain. One might interpret this to mean that solitude is a source of strength, stability formed over millennia as the earth shifted and changed beneath our feet, as ice melted and water flowed forth, as volcanoes erupted and then cooled, making way for new mountains and geological beauty to emerge. Or, on the other hand, one might think this mountain of solitude is treacherous, hilly, unstable, and uncertain. One might look at it and think, I bet the air is thin up there, and really, how good could the few even be? And I expect that both hold a bit of the truth. But the truth and the gift of solitude can only emerge, not from our thinking of solitude, but when we step outside of our homes, our hearts are familiar in order to experience what is only possible in the wilderness. I expect each of you felt a bit like you were in the wilderness during this sabbatical or at different times of your lives. There are no limits to the mount moments and mountains we can find solitude in this life. As a congregation alone and together, we journeyed through solitude and sabbatical and found some truths, found out some truths about ourselves, this community, and our world. These discoveries are only possible if we are willing to let go of what we know to discover more deeply who we are becoming. Who we are becoming. In contemplating my becoming about the person I've become, the husband and father I have become, the minister I have become over these past six years, I'm left not feeling alone in my, uh, in my solitude, but grateful for the view, grateful for the view, the experience of this moment in life. Throughout my sabbatical, I've tried, as Heather Newman encourages, to consider places for lost or hidden keys. And what I've learned again and again is the truth found in Newman's conclusion. They say that gratitude is a key. That gratitude indeed is a key, a key for our journeys, our ministry, our work of justice. Gratitude is a key to animate our hearts so we fall not into hopelessness or apathy, but fall into greater loving covenant with one another, that we fall into a more uh, into a greater commitment to our most cherished values and that we and to those that we are called to make manifest in the world. When I walked back into community this last Sunday as we celebrated our homecoming as a community, I thought of words from Laura Foley in our second reading titled The Once Invisible Garden. She questions beautifully about who and where we end up and how we end up where we end up on this journey. She wonders, what luck or fate, instinct or grace brought me here? In shade, beneath hidden stars, a soft summer morning, seeing with my whole being, love made visible. All of us might consider, during sabbatical or now on this Sunday, what luck or fate, instinct or grace brought us here. In shade, beneath hidden stars, a soft summer morning, seeing with our whole being love made visible. Love was made visible in our time apart. I have heard it from so many of you of the deep experiences of connection and challenge and transformation. Love was made visible in my time outside of Columbus with my mom and dad in Europe with Hattie and my children and back here in my home of Indiana. Love was made visible last Sunday as we covenanted once more, as we chose freely to begin again in love, the work of love, the work of hope and compassion and justice within and beyond the walls of this sanctuary. Love has been, has been made visible this morning again, like the sun rising. We feel it on our faces and in the faces of those beside us. 
my friends, with gratitude as our guide and our history, as the wind at our backs, love will continue to be made visible in each of you and in this congregation, this once invisible garden, awakening, awakening, awakening to offer this world the nourishment and hope that our community can and will provide. With thanks and gratitude unto the end, may it be so. And amen. <laughs>